Hello, it's Andrew Eborn here and welcome, a very, very warm welcome to another edition of the Andrew Eborn Show, where my regular guest in this extraordinary <laughs> is the wonderful Spiros Milaris. How are you, Spiros? Hello. Very good, thank you. Good it's to be back. A, it's a it's lovely long time no seeing all of this. <laughs> well, and in the last episode, we were talking about a young Spiros and how your father would buy lots of things. He'd buy musical instruments in the hope that people would play them. But he bought you your very first eight millimeter camera at the age of six. And you had a chance to go around recording stuff. And your grandfather at the same time sparked your interest in magic. And it's the combination of the two which should explain a little bit about that wonderful man of mystery, Spiros Malaris, today. And what took you and the combining both of them into what has been called, very modestly, the greatest hoax the world has ever seen. And that is the alien autopsy. Da, da, da. <laughs> we love it. We love it. It's really good. And I love this because I know several of the characters involved in this particular story. I went to school with Nick Pope and he's okay. been on, I see, you see, and he's been on the show talking about sort of things. I know Ray, as you know, he's just around the corner. And I know you and Anton Deck, I know, and I was down in Cannes and, and all this sort of stuff. All of these elements. I could play Alien Autopsy bingo and call the house before anybody else it's cool. <laughs> fantastic but i love this and this is what i'm going to do i'm going to set it let's set it for the context for everybody else who's watching thinking what on earth are they prattling on about let's put it in context take us back to july 1947 at a little place called roswell okay um well what happened was um something crashed in the desert of New Mexico, uh, just outside of Roswell, and and I, I know this, I know this story quite intimately because I went to Roswell and I interviewed thirty odd people who were there at the time, and and I got all their accounts of what happened. And in essence, a big commotion, something crashed. Uh, a lot of people thought it was something fr not from this world, um, and the military got involved very quickly. They cordoned off the whole area, and they basically said. We've got a flying saucer, nothing to see here, okay? <laughs> Just go home and we'll tell you about it later, okay? So they didn't let anyone near it. And then a big military operation, they cleared the area. It was actually on a, on a ranch owned by a guy called Matt Brazel. Now, Matt Brazel was your proper cowboy, okay? That was his job. He was a proper, that's his job. He got on a horse and he went around and, 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 and herded all the cows and, and that's, what he, that's what he did. And he had the hat, the whole big, the whole thing, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're made as a cowboy. Have you got your hat, haven't you? No, have you got to have a hat? If you haven't got the hat, that's it. It's, 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 the spurs, the bow legs. That the wasn't take you seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, something crashed. Once they cleared it all away, then the press release was, sorry, we made a mistake. It wasn't a, a flying saucer. It was a weather balloon, okay? Which is quite funny because... Uh, weather balloons were dropping in people's gardens regularly. They, everyone knew what a weather balloon looked like, yeah. made out of like a foil material. No big deal, right? You have to ask yourself, because I've heard you tell this before, you have to ask yourself, did they really think anybody would swallow that? Because lots of these weather balloons, as you say, were dropping down. You know what a weather balloon looks like. You're not going to confuse that with a flying saucer. Or, as you know, we love media manipulation. We love the idea of never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Yeah. Do you think they were deliberately trying to stoke the interest? No, I think what they did was a very, very good, it was a very well thought out plot, okay? If you're the US military and you've designed an unusual aircraft, something like a Harrier jump jet, something like, you know, the triangular kind of shape Air, aircraft so they haven't got wings as you and i know an aircraft looks like okay so that crashes it's on a test flight and it crashes now you don't want the soviets to know that your new technology isn't very good okay so what do you do you don't want the people in roswell to know what it is in terms of its new technology that's failed as well right because the people talk 
So what do you do? You say something ridiculous like it's a flying saucer because that will divert all the attention away from the reality and create a false narrative. Okay. Once you've got that false narrative and everyone's excited, it's a flying saucer. Then they go, don't be silly guys. It wasn't a flying saucer. Of course it's not a flying saucer. It was a weather balloon. Right. And now what you've got is you've got the circus. You've got the, it, it wasn't a weather balloon. It was a flying saucer. No one's talking about the aircraft that they crashed. And double. so this is what I believe happened. Um, because if you, the double speak that you get, um, one person says, well, it wasn't something I've ever seen before. Okay, so the DJ on the radio says it wasn't of this earth. It wasn't something they've ever seen before. No, they didn't say that. He didn't say it wasn't from this earth or from this world. He said they hadn't seen it before, right? So a triangular aircraft fits that bill, right? Um, there were crash test dummies, okay? And that's what they found, I believe, okay? So I've seen photos and I've really gone into it. So I believe the aliens that we're talking about were crash test dummies. It all got collected very quickly um nobody really knows what it was but i think it's safe to say 25 years later still nothing no evidence at all absolutely nothing so and there's reason to let go now there's there's they've, they've released documents they've released secrets uh in in the um what do they call the, the act uh, they're, they're under the official secrets act and things like oh, that yeah. And, 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 and the principle, as you say, is a number of years have passed since that would have happened. So if your theory is right, and um, as I mentioned, Nick Pope, his job, he worked for the Ministry of Defence over here for 21 years. Yes. But the most interesting bit for a lot of people was for two or three of those 21 years, he was in charge of their UFO di division. So he is the real Fox Mulder. So in other words, he would go around and investigate all these things which were unidentified, no clear explanation. And he was telling me that about 5%, 5% of the various cases that he got, there wasn't an explanation. Doesn't mean that it was out, out of this world. It just means there wasn't an explanation. Yeah. Following your thing and your theory that it was just a military aircraft and we didn't want the enemy to know that we've developed this thing, yeah. hasn't the time now passed that people could reveal that actually it was an aircraft? Well, yeah, I would have thought so. I would have thought so, but um, I think the pressing, the pressing business takes over from that. That's dead business. Why are we going back to embarrass ourselves? Why would you want to go back and say, actually, you know what, it was an error. You wouldn't want to do it. So just let it be. Okay. And there's another big, there's another big thing as well. Uh, I told off a couple of uh, ufologists. Uh, they called themselves ufologists. Okay. They, well, I, love they, it. They, I love it. I love that. And I love what that, they say. They're not going to listen. Yeah, they investigate UFOs with no qualifications. Yep. You can be a ufologist without being qualified. Um, it's the only ology that you can you can you can do without having a, without having a single bit of paper to your name. Uh, Maureen Lippman will be proud of you. It's got to be good. yeah. But but I told them off because they were having a go at me because I created a hoax which they investigated and they this is what they said to me. Okay, yes. we wasted all our time and because of you, who's going to pay us for all that time? I said, well, all the books you wrote, they paid you, right? And, and if we're honest, anyone that's watching that's in the UFO community, that, that if they're honest, they're going to say, do you know what Spiros did? He shone a big spotlight on us. Well, and he you. said, question everything. And, believe and question everything is exactly right. And why, why I say that a lot of people won't listen is that you, you will find with every argument, it's the same with the presidential debates happening at the moment. Yes. You're, you're, there are certain people who you're never going to change whether you're on the side of there are UFOs and we should believe it, or there are no UFOs. It's the middle ground where you have some chance of being persuasive because most people will turn around and say, like any conspiracy theory, well, he's denying it. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? That would be their answer. And that's a sort of... A, a, a few people are saying that. Yeah. A lot of people say that I, I'm paid by the men in black to yeah. say it's not real when really it is real. Yeah, well, you are. I know you told me you confessed to that in an earlier show. Go and look for that episode where Spiros confessed to being yeah. paid by the men in black. It's kind you know, of... Yeah, yeah. Um, bottom line is this. I'm not saying that a UFOs don't exist. And I'm not saying that aliens don't exist. I'm saying, you know what? They probably do. But what I am saying, 
categorically without without uh, any any misinterpretation i'm saying yeah. i've never seen an alien yeah personally okay. and i've never seen a ufo and when i when i say an unidentified see a ufo when you say the, 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 that phrase ufo you're saying unidentified flying object yeah. i've seen lots of those yeah but that's it and that's what it is right that's what nick will say because that was his job and and when pressed about it he will simply say that absolutely five percent of the, the things that he went to investigate lots of quickly explain five percent would turn around and he, he doesn't have an explanation Do, when i asked him does he believe that there's an alien his answer is well i don't know and that has to be the honest answer he hasn't seen it it was his job to try and find out he hasn't seen an alien so let's just go back to roswell just to finish that story okay. there. so july 1947 unidentified flying object lands there lots crashes. of speculation crashes. was that crashes crashes, crashes. well yes crashes. remind and me to come back to that I, 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 yes, absolutely, because of what happens, and people should know what happens to bodies when, when there's a crash. We'll, we'll, we'll come on to that. Absolutely, that's very important. So it crashes, no explanation as to what it might be. The story changes slightly, which get, raises every suspicion when you talk about weather balloons as opposed to flying saucers, so people assume it's a cover-up. To this day, there has not been a clear explanation. Is that fine? That's absolutely true. Okay. Um, what I was saying about the, the uh, Roswell incident and why not to come clean, if you go to Roswell, you will find that it is a circus, okay? There is a, there's a UFO museum and there are crash sites. I visited four different crash sites because anyone that's got a plot of land can make a bit of money. Yes. You know, oh no, no, it wasn't over there. It was here, it yeah. crashed on it, right? And all of a sudden it's like, well, I want to visit all of them because I want to make sure that I visited the one, right? Um, and you, you pay your, your $10 and you go into the, a bit of land and you look around and you think, okay, well, there's a, a burnt bush. Maybe that's where it, you don't know, right? So they, they have made money from it. It's, it's paying the rent. Okay, Loch, so. Loch Ness Monster, you don't want to deny Nessie. Oh. People, people, and people love a good story. As I say, don't let the truth stand in the way of a good story. So I get Roswell. It is an unsolved mystery. And the great thing is when you go and talk to people, and, still, and I know you spoke to 30 other people down there, there will be some who convince themselves that it's true. And this it's is what I, I, I talked about credibility. As people, people can be very credible. Talk to me about some of those people. We'll come on to what you okay. did later on. Talk to me about some this, of the people right? you spoke to. A story that will make you stop and think, because it did, it made me stop and think, okay? Matt Brazel, the cowboy, yeah. okay, was, was on record of having got on his horse, okay, gone to his nearest neighbour to show her a piece of this spaceship that he picked up, which was unusual material, very unusual material. So I went there to go and visit Loretta Proctor, who was in her 80s, and she was his neighbour. Guess how far she was? Oh, miles away, I imagine, as a neighbour. How many? 20 miles away. 20 miles away, good oh, heavens. This is how excited he was. He went on horseback in a storm to go to Loretta Proctor to show her this bit of foil-like material that he got from this spaceship. And yeah. he told her all about it. So I, I interviewed her and I asked her, what was it he showed you? She says, well, it was like a metal that you wadded it up into your hand and when you let go, it came out perfectly clean without a crease on it. And she said, you couldn't cut it. You couldn't tear it. You couldn't, it was very light. It was like aluminum foil, but metal. Okay. I thought, that's fantastic. I said, you've got a very good memory. She said, well, you never forget that in your life, you know? So me being the smart, the smart, you know, um, director, I want to, I want to catch her out. Right. And I said to her, Miss, Miss Proctor, can I ask you a, a, a silly question? Why is it that spaceships always kind of crash or they're always seen in a little place in the middle of nowhere in America? And it's always that, you know, a little kind of, and I, I think I used the word redneck, which wasn't, wasn't a good idea. And she got quite upset about that. And she said, young man, let me tell you, in American accent, obviously, she said, the reason they came here and not, and she used the word Brent Cross. The reason she came, they came here and not Brent Cross she said, it's because we were the only people on the planet that had a nuclear weapon. Ah. We were testing them 
right here in White Sands. And she says, so if you were from another planet, where would you go? Would you want to go to Brent Cross or would you want to go where the action is? Right. And I'm sitting there. My, oh, my. Wow. Wow. What an answer. Right. Put me in my place. But that's that was the bottom line. The bottom line was some lots of things happened, like Mac traveling 20 miles on horseback in a storm. Yeah. It wasn't a weather balloon. OK. And it didn't sound like it could be an air, a, a, a human made you know that, that whole wadding the you know then i spoke to somebody else and i said what do you make of this wadding of the material that came out and you know and he said to me and i've got a film of this and he said to me well you know what maybe it's right in front of your eyes i said what do you mean he said well maybe we took that technology and we're using it right now he said and it's right in front of your eyes please explain and he took his glasses off yes and it was made of memory metal and he bent them like that and they came back again right and he said maybe they're in front of your eyes they they put them back again. so he's insinuating that we've taken the technology from the spaceship and created our own you know made our own stuff yeah. so a lot of people believe and a lot of people have very good arguments and but the, you know when you do the research you find things like the microwave was invented in guess when 1947. There you go. Okay. The microwave, you think, is a modern thing, wouldn't you? You wouldn't think, you know, because my grandma never had a, a microwave, right? So so in my lifetime, she never had a, a microwave. So it must be a modern thing that came out maybe in the 80s. No, it's 1947. So we have had technology way back. It's just not, it wasn't commonplace. It wasn't being used everywhere. So um, I don't know. The jury's out. As far as I'm concerned, the jury's out. What What crashed? Well, I, um, I, I think it is interesting, and, and what what I like, and this is why I like sort of drilling down into it. When you look at witnesses and what makes somebody a credible witness, because I I don't think, I mean, to, to, in order to be a lie, you have to consciously know that you're telling an untruth, and there are ways that people can persuade themselves. You and I know, as performers, there are there are ways that pe- we can convince them that they've seen certain things. We, we know that. They remember, they remember it differently. They will remember it differently. There's dual reality, sometimes many different ways of doing things. So we can create an impression in somebody's mind that they will genuinely believe happens. That's what we do that day in, day out. That's what many yeah. members of the magic circle will do. Yeah. What happens is, so I don't think a lot of these people are lying in terms of that. So when people say, are they lying? That's a conscious decision to tell an untruth. When you drill down into what the witnesses said, there are alternative explanations. And that's why you can look at that. And let's say when Nick Pope does his little analysis, he has, it's very easy. He says most of it's very boring. They can explain very quickly, 95% of that. When you're looking at the credibility of a witness, some of the most persuasive people are those who used to be skeptics. Now, yeah. when you were interviewing your people who suddenly that road to Damascus moment say, I never thought this was ever possible, but then bang. bang. And then you're the expert beforehand. You understood, you've seen absolutely everything. That moment of the 30 witnesses you spoke to, did you have one of those so-called expert witnesses? All of them, all the military people, all the doctors, the, um, all those kind of people, they were all experts. Here's, uh, there were two contrasts, okay? One guy wasn't there in 1947. He was there in 1969, right? right? He was in the military. A guy called Clifford Stone, Sergeant Clifford Stone. Now, you speak to him, he's very, very coherent, very, he he knows his stuff. You can see he speaks from authority. And he told me that he saw, now bear in mind, I'm the maker of the alien autopsy, but they don't know that. They think that's from 1947, so I couldn't have made it, okay? I'm just a guy doing a documentary, and I'm about this film, okay? So they're talking to me, but I know the truth, okay? They don't know that. So I say to him, so what do you make of of this film? And he said, well, I've seen it before. I said, oh, really? Where where have you seen it before? And he said, well, I was driving some officers to uh, Fort Worth in Dallas, and um, they went inside to, to have a, a, a private briefing, a secret briefing. 
And she said, and I was with another driver, another officer waiting outside. And then we could see through some plexiglass down into the gallery. They were watching what we thought were like B sci-fi movies. And, and he said, I, and I saw this film. They were watching that film in 1969. And it's been haunting me since. Now I know it wasn't, it wasn't even made till 1995. So he couldn't have seen this. So as a thinking person, as a, a fair person, I've got to say, well, maybe he saw something else yeah. that looks like it, maybe. It was just, if it's similar, I don't know, right? Could, I could have fluked something. So I let it go, right? I carried on the conversation. So I said to him, so, so was it like this film or was it exactly like this film? He said, identical. I said, please define that for me. What do you mean by identical? The room, the, where the clock is, all that stuff, or just the body? What, what is it? No, everything. Exactly. It was exactly like this. Well, no, I put the clock there. I put the telephone here. I put the table there. To, to fluke all those things on, on another film that he's seen, yeah. well, I'm better than I thought I was, right? I can't do that, right? So, so I, I knew he wasn't telling the truth. Now, what he could have been doing, because people want to be special, right? They want to be special. They want to be part of something. So there's, there's this big roller coaster now, this thing that everyone wants to be a part of it. So he comes back with, oh, yes, and I saw it, and, uh, and uh, they caught me, and they, they then had to put me, into, they put me into a cell, and then they, they interrogated me that I didn't see it. And until I admitted that I didn't see it, they wouldn't let me go. And he started crying on camera quite believable right this is really intense stuff intense stuff but i know he couldn't have seen this film so the, i left it i let it be and then i found out the man was a little bit he embellished the truth a little bit here and there he did go to an institution at one point he had a bre breakdown um so so you know what everyone's got their story yeah, and, and, and that, that's the point, isn't it, Spears, is you're, you're looking at that, and, and that's why it's so important to look at this in detail, because every single witness, you, you, it's part of the lawyer's training, if you like, you're questioning their credibility. What is the reason they're saying what they're saying? Is it because they're out and out lying or they're a bit, they're embarrassed not to go along with the flow and you, you know that some people will say yes for the sake of doing it. If you interview somebody whilst you're wearing a white clothing and a clipboard, people are being made to do extraordinary things yeah. when you're experimenting with those sort of people. So each and every witness, and we, we, we'll do, dissect this over a future series. This series will run and run and run. <laughs> the whole world has bought your book. I can. <laughs> but, but that's the principle. When you drill down into it, what you can clearly say, and this is where we are in the story so far, is that at the moment, nobody has explained what has happened in July 1947, what landed. Nobody's explained. There are a few possibilities, but nobody's categorically said, yes, it, came, it was an alien. This is what happens. Here's all the empirical evidence. And nobody's definitely said it was definitely a, a hot air balloon. This is what happens. Nobody's confirmed any of those either way. That is, that's a right. problem. So it is currently unexplained. So we, we yes. can see that. Yeah. And it, it will always be, I think. Well, I, I don't think so. I, I think that we can drill down now with information, this current age, when yeah. information is getting more and more readily available and some of the witnesses are still there, there will be people who know what happened. There will be those who believe they know what happened and we can interrogate those maybe a little bit more and look at that. But there will be those who definitely know. And I think we should drill, drill down into that. Yeah, yeah. That's 1947. Let's then go forward. And a lot of your witnesses, they could be right. They could have seen a film. Absolutely. And what you're yes. saying, just working on the truth, what, what you're saying, and we're going to look at this in detail, what you're saying is that they did not see your film because right. your film wasn't made until several years afterwards. Is that fair? <laughs> what, what I have said... And, and I've laid a number of challenges out for people, you know, because I, I work on logic, you know, I work logic and facts. Now, if you say, OK, well, prove to me now, it's very hard to prove. For a long time, I've had a hard time proving it's not real. Yeah. Then I sat back and I thought, OK, I know all the mistakes I made. They're hidden, but I know there's quite a few mistakes. I can highlight those. OK, um, now what Ray Santilli did was who's this is the, the gentleman who marketed the film. Okay, he's basically said, 
that he had original film of this that's deteriorated to, to, to a point where it can't be used. And somehow I've create, recreated that film that he showed me. Showed me no film. I've never seen any film from, from Santilli. But that's a better thing for me. You know, as a filmmaker, ask any filmmaker, what's easiest? Make something from your imagination or copy something so precisely that you can marry it up to itself, right? And make it all part of one thing. That's almost impossible. I would say totally impossible right? It can't be done because you have to marry everything up to the finest detail. But let's, just before you, you introduce Ray and, and what, what he's currently saying, let's go back to when you first met because around this time, as you know, the, the next week it's starting is MIPCOM, yes. the TV festival. Uh, can, a lot of people associate can just with films. There is MIP, which is the, the television, MIPCOM, which is just about to happen, TV, one of the biggest TV markets. MEDEM was the music festival, which used to take place in January and then got moved to, to June. Now you as, uh, what happens at these events is like a networking thing. If you go down there, if you contact contacts beforehand, you say, I'm gonna be in town, can we discuss business? As I understand it, you were down there, you're gonna be there with a film crew and Ray was round the corner and you thought you might as well meet and see if there's a bit of extra work you can pick up. Is that uh, as pretty much it. to where, where we are with, with me then? So talk me through, talk me through from there. Okay, well, I was supposed to meet Ray um, once we got there. Um, and uh, I was very impressed with Ray at the time because he said, when you get to France, call me on my mobile. Now, that... If you contact beforehand, you say, I'm going to be in town, can we discuss business? As I understand it, you were down there, you're going to be there with a film crew, and Ray was round the corner, and you thought you might as well meet and see if there's a bit of extra work you can pick up. Is that... Uh, That's a, pretty much it. Um, to where, where we are with, with me then. So talk me through, talk me through from there. Okay, well, I was supposed to meet Ray um, once we got there. Um, and uh, I was very impressed with Ray at the time because he said, when you get to France, call me on my mobile. Now, that today isn't a big deal. At that time, that was a huge deal. His phone worked in France, right? Because <laughs> they just didn't, you know, it was, it was a lot of money. It was oh, it's an open balls and horses thing, wasn't it? Where he yeah, yeah, did, yeah. It, it is Robin Reliant and called the person in the, in the, in the house. Yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal. So, so um, you know, my phone bill at the time was like £600 a month. You know, this is where we're dealing with here. It's brand new technology. He had a phone that worked in France, right? This is very impressive. So, um so I was going to call him after we got there. The evening we got there, um, we stopped to have something to eat. And I was going to call him the next day. We went to a restaurant. And after a lot of deliberation where we're going to eat, we ended up in this one place. Uh, I met up with a guy from Warner Brothers, had a little chat with him. Da, 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 and, and next to him was Ray Santilli. And I didn't know. All evening, Ray had been sitting there, and I didn't know he was him. And it wasn't until the guy said my name that Ray looked around and goes, Spiros? Oh, Ray? You remember which restaurant it was? It was an Italian restaurant. <laughs> it was an Italian restaurant, and it was um, just o just opposite the main um, the main stretch there with all the restaurants. What's it called? Oh, well, there's the Vesuvio, which has sort of pizzas and things like that. No, no, it wasn't that one. Posha. I can't, you know, I can't remember what. what restaurant. I have to look it up. We, we want to get the facts in the story right. I will, I will. You must have um, your book. So, you so must... we finished. Um, it's so much in the book. I can't be I can't, that one little detail is not important. There's so much. Uh, I can't even go there. Okay, your um, Italian restaurant in France. Your Italian yeah. restaurant, and um, and we met and we started talking. They put the chairs on the on the tables. The girl was mopping up around us, and we're still there uh, talking. And he dropped the bombshell that he he had a film of an alien autopsy. And I was trying to get my head around it, never heard of such a thing. What, what the hell, what is that? What is an alien autopsy? Um, I wasn't in the community. I didn't know anything about Roswell. I didn't know anything about, you know. So as soon as he said he's got an autopsy of an alien being from outer space, that was it. I just thought I just wasted two hours of this guy. You know, I'm tired and I've been, I've been listening to him all night and I've been, I've been giving him credibility and, and now he's dropped this one. So he said, when you come to London, back to London, come and see me and I'll show you the film. I thought, well, we don't want nothing to lose. So I did that and he showed me a very bad video uh, of, of nonsense. And, and I just said to him, Ray, this is not real. 
just des describe what you, I mean, you talked about in, in, in other episodes. Um, um, what, what was it? You talked about a papier mache head and, and that yeah, sort of thing. It was, it was made by uh, a guy called Keith Bateman, uh, who ran a company called AK Music yes. in Milton Keynes. And, uh, and they did it for fun. They went to a barn. Uh, a farmer's barn and they just put a table out and uh, one of the guys lay there and put his head to the side and covered it up and they put a papier mache head I think they may have I don't know how they made it but if I had to make it what I would do is I'll blow a balloon up put some papier mache around it just to stiffen yep. it all up a little bit and then paint two black eyes on it and stick it on the side there because it was so dark and so dimly lit and so you, it doesn't matter what it was it doesn't that just doesn't matter and uh, they were pulling bits of string out of the stomach and cat food and whatever they had in there. And it was just, it was just really nonsense. So, um, and it was, wasn't supposed to be anything. Well, Ray saw this and thought, you know what? I might just get away with this. You never know, right? You know what Ray's like. So, so uh, I just chanced my arm. So he showed it to a couple of people who didn't blink. No one said, oh, this is not real. So he thought, I'm going to get away with this. I can market this. If I just don't tell people what it is, I just say, I don't know what it is. You tell me what it is. I don't know what it is. Then I might get away with it. So along comes this guy, me. I come along and I sit there and I say, it's not real. And he's now thinking, oh, God, it's not going to get past this guy. It's not going to get past anyone else. So, and I told him why it wasn't real. Uh, the, the telltale signs of it being shot on video. And video wasn't available then. It was VHS. It wasn't what, what were the telltale signs? Just well, there were there were camera glitches. You know, uh, if you put a, you know, you get a camcorder and you put a tape into the camcorder and you start and stop. In the early days, you would get a glitch every time you stopped. It wouldn't be a clean cut. Um, and then when you edit it a few times, because what they did was they they transferred it several times to make it older, to make it de to degrade it. Right. Uh, it was shot in colour and then they brought it down to black and white and then they made it eventually very grainy and, and fuzzy. Um, and I could see all of those traits, that that's what's happened here. So because I'm backward engineering it, I'm thinking, how would I create it? So if you do that, uh, say with any magic, you know, you just backward engineer it. Say, okay, how would I make this happen? Um, and, and you create your version of it. But it, most of the time you will probably hit the right, the right method. So um, once I left, and he was, he looked distraught. He looked like a man who'd spent a lot of money on this film. And, it, and now, you know, this Greek, this Greek chap has turned up and told me it's not real. So I felt bad for him because I, I believed him. I believed that he genuinely thought it was real. Well, you, you do, rather like some of your witnesses, you thought that Ray actually believed that what he had was an... But he didn't. He, he, knew, he knew very well what he had. Is, is, so, is that is that filmed somewhere at the moment? It's it's online somewhere. Yeah, it's called the tent footage. The tent footage. Um, I, I'm going to put links and stuff. For, my book comes with uh, a website. Okay. And all these different things that I talk about are all there. So if anybody wants to go and see a particular film or a clip or whatever that I speak about, it's all it's all there as an archive. So um, I got in my car. I'm driving home. You know what I said to you before in, in the previous part? I said, you always try and turn a negative into a positive, you know? And I, and I thought, how can I turn this around? I've spent a lot of time on this now. I've, I've had a meeting with him in Cannes. I've come up to, to the Western to see him. Uh, I can't leave this now, having invested, you know? And I'm, I'm into the story now. And I'm thinking, well, there's a story here. So I called my, my partner and, and friend, John Humphreys, who's um, he's one of the top sculptors in the world today. Yeah. Uh, Royal Academy lecturer, uh, just started. and I called him up and I said, John, I just saw this this film. It was so bad. We could have made it with our feet. And he said, Why don't we? And and that's when the penny dropped. You know what? We could do this properly, right? So I said, Okay, are you in? Yeah, I'm in. Okay, so pick the phone up again, Ray. I've been thinking about your film. I, I can make it for you properly, but this is what we need to do. You want to look at 
anybody who's an expert in these matters needs to be convinced of their own area of expertise, whether it's the clock, the instruments, the way you carry out the autopsy as opposed to being a surgeon, all of those little elements, the way that if there's a, a crash, what happens to bodies and that sort of stuff as opposed to being shot, all of these elements tie in to make something convincing.